All right, folks, uh, we're into the evening shift here, and uh, we're in chapter 28. No, pardon me. We're actually in chapter 31. I hope you've been enjoying things so far. It's uh, sometimes a bit of a wild ride. You don't know what's coming next. But it's always real. It is always real. With Rush Dooney. Okay. So why don't we make a start with chapter 31. Planning. Parmalee. Thirty-one, Planning for Famine A distinguished American, E. Parmalee Prentice, who wrote two important works on the subject of famine, A Farming for Famine, written in 1936, and Hunger and History in 1939, gives us a vivid picture of the fearful role of famine in man's life. On page after page, he recounts the centuries-old horror of death by starvation, of people eating the bark of trees, resorting to cannibalism and the eating of their own children, and still dying by the tens of thousands and even millions. This was common for ages, and well into the 19th... Dude, okay, well, not a total disaster. This was common for ages and well into the 18th century. The world at that time was sparsely populated. There was no shortage of land and growing space, but people lived meagerly most of the time. Hunger stalked every continent, and famine was commonplace. During one century alone, Prentice lifts it. Prentice listed. Yeah, turn that uh, gate off. Let's see if it makes a difference. During one century alone, Prentice listed fifteen famines in England and other famines in Scotland and Ireland. These famines in England were accompanied by the usual horrors. People eating the bark of trees, grass, turning to cannibalism and dying on all sides. During the reign of Edward I, a 23-year dearth saw the churches without any wine for communion. In China, throughout the centuries, famine has been a part of the life of the people and a normal part of the mortality rate. In Europe... Before the beginning of the 19th century, the same thing was true. Famine was a major cause of death and a normal part of life. The one part of the world that has not known famine has been the United States. After the early years of colonisation, America has seen, instead of hunger and famine, an abundance of food and a standard of eating unknown by royalty of ancient times. One of the vivid descriptions of farm life comes from the autobiography of Mark Twain. In writing of his mark, my mouth is not quite there. In writing of his boyhood, Mark Twain said, "It was a heavenly place for a boy, that farm of my uncle John's. The house was a double log one with a spacious floor." roofed in, connecting it with the kitchen. In the summer, the table was set in the middle of that shady and breezy floor, and the sumptuous meals, well, that makes me cry to think of them. Fried chicken, roast pig, wild and tame turkeys, ducks and geese, venison just killed, squirrels, rabbits, pheasants, partridges, prairie chickens, biscuits, hot batter cakes, hot buckwheat cakes, succotash, Butter beans, string beans, tomatoes, peas, Irish potatoes, sweet potatoes, buttermilk, sweet milk, clabber, watermelons, musk melons, cantaloupes, all fresh from the garden, apple pie, peach pie, pumpkin pie, apple dumplings, peach cobbler, I can't remember the rest. 
The way that the things were cooked was perhaps the main splendor. Before we dismiss Mark Twain's picture by saying that America was then young, rich and underpopulated, let us remember that before the white man settled America, the Indians, who were perhaps at most 300,000 persons across the continent, starved regularly. Famine was a normal part of Indian life, and the reason was not overpopulation. In fact, this myth of overpopulation has nothing to do with the subject of food and the supply of food. People have, age after age, starved to death in lands with small populations and rich soil, and also lived richly in heavily populated areas. Both Prentice and Cornelius Walford have pointed out that the basic causes for famine are not those we usually consider, but rather human folly and ignorance. Storms and droughts are a normal part of human existence. Nature is a condition of life, and man can protect himself to a considerable degree from natural disasters. Moreover, natural disasters tend to be local, confined to a particular area. It doesn't flood everywhere, but in a particular area. A cyclone strikes a particular region, not a whole nation. The basic causes of famine are man-made, and man's greatest problem is to protect himself against himself. Now, according to Walford and Prentice, four important causes of famine are the following. 1. The prevention of cultivation or the willful destruction of crops. 2. Defective agriculture caused by communities. Defective agriculture caused by communistic control of land. 3. Government's interference by regulation or taxation. 4. Currency restrictions, including debasing the coin. These four factors add up to one thing. Socialism. A major product of socialism is always agricultural chaos and famine. The old Russia was a breadbasket of Europe. It has had several major famines and a chronic agricultural problem since going communist. The United States, in Mark Twain's day, was a free country, and its production of food was the envy of the world. Much of the world has rich soil, but little of the world has the free men to make use of that soil. Today, the United States is moving steadily into socialism and into problems of food shortage. We have been stockpiling American-produced foods to give away while importing the same foods often from abroad. The United States is now the world's second largest importer of farm commodities, second only to Great Britain. The very items that the federal government claims we are overproducing, we are at the same time importing because we are short of them. Controls are leading us into economic chaos, and some of the very same federal officials are beginning to talk of the possibilities of food shortages and famine. In the last century, when Europe joined America in freeing its economy... <clears throat> In the last century... When Europe joined America in freeing its economics of state control, Europe, like America, enjoyed a famine-free century, although its population in some areas more than doubled. Together, Europe and the United States set a standard of liberty and economic security and freedom. For all the world and all the continents began to experience a measure of victory over the ancient curse of famine. All over the world, with the growth of liberty... I'm phoning this in to some extent. All over the world, with the growth of liberty, populations increased and the supply of food increased. It was free farmers who made possible a new growth of human welfare. However, with the 20th century, socialism offered a supposed shortcut to paradise on earth. Statist controls... As the tide turned towards socialism, so also did famine begin to return. 
the more severe the socialism, the more severe the famine. Instead of blaming socialism for hunger and famine, the socialists began to make excuses. Overpopulation is a myth created by the statists to excuse their growing failure to feed people. But the American Indians, as we have seen, starved regularly before the coming of the white man. Very commonly they turned to cannibalism, and the very word cannibalism comes from the name of the Carib Indians of Haiti, whom Columbus met. The cannibalism of the Caribbeans was spoken of as a Caribbean practice, and the word Caribbean gradually changed to cannibal. The Indian tribes lacked freedom. Tribalism in its various forms was a kind of primitive communism. Even the freest tribes, where private property had some standing, lacked the freedom that is necessary for initiative. As a result, the Indians starved regularly on a rich continent. But the white settlers overpopulated America as compared to the Indian population and lived in plenty. The difference was liberty, faith and hard work. By the sweat of their brow, the settlers made the land productive and rich. They made the name of America synonymous with liberty and wealth in the minds of all the peoples of the earth. Now, however, we are supposedly going to overcome Overcome. Now, however, we are supposedly going to overcome all man's problems by laws, regulations and push buttons. In fact, former Secretary of Agriculture Orville L. Freeman has predicted that we will have farming by satellite by the year 2000. Space satellites will give farmers the basic information for farming. According to Freeman, While the farmers of tomorrow study reports in their air-conditioned offices, relieved at last of the physical drudgery and occupational anxiety so traditionally theirs, and the Secretary of Agriculture takes unaccustomed ease at his desk in Washington, these shining satellites, equipped with the most sophisticated remote sensing instruments, are supplying the information needed to make key decisions. Freeman went on to tell a convention of the National Association of Science Teachers. Information gathered from throughout the world will be transmitted to computers for analysis and immediate use. The soils of the world will have been inventoried and each crop will be grown either on the soil best suited for it or on soil chemically modified for maximum productivity. Through information gathered by the satellites, the governments will be able to make accurate predictions to guide marketing and distribution of farm products to avoid waste and local shortages and surpluses. What Freeman is in effect saying is that the federal government, using the satellites, will analyse, control and determine all farming in terms of an overall plan. This is, of course, not freedom. It is socialism. And it is planning for famine because nothing will produce agricultural chaos more quickly than this central planning. Famine has long been a stranger to America, not since the earliest settlements had it. Not since the earliest settlement has it been has it been felt. Not since the earliest settlement has it been felt in these shores. But hunger may again enter our history soon if we continue our planning for famine. Okay, Duke. Let's try chapter 32. Thirty-two, The Will to Death In a book I've written, Freud, I have analysed the theories of the founder of psychoanalysis and expressed my radical disagreement with them. At one point, Sigmund Freud did say something which... Me- At one point, Sigmund Freud did say something with 
which it is possible for us to agree, Freud spoke of two basic motive forces in man, the will to death and the will to live. Of these two, he felt the stronger and more basic force is the will to death, a suicidal drive to end life which governs the unconscious of men. Albert William Levy, in commenting on Freud, concluded, We are thus compelled to say that the goal of all life is death. Our agreement with this is, of course, a limited one. For a Christian, since Jesus Christ is the new way of life within him, his basic drive is to live, to live righteously under God. The more he grows in grace, the more strongly his will to live flourish. Flourishes. The more he grows in grace, the more strongly his will to live flourishes. The strong Christian will be governed not only by a will to live, but a will to victory. The psalmist declared, I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. Psalm 118, 17. St. John declared that, this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. 1 John 5, 4 When men are without faith, they are governed instead by an overpowering, although unconscious, will to death. In a study which, while defective at points from a Christian perspective, is still very important, the psychologist Samuel J. Warner studies the urge to mass destruction in this urge to mass destruction, the individual will to death seeks to involve all men in its suicidal course. Warner cites, quote, Two major dynamic factors, end quote, which enter into the causation of this urge to mass destruction. First, quote, the craving for individual power, end quote, for the sheer amoral assertion of the ego. And second, the motive of revenge. In this will to power, Relativism and nihilism are basic. In answer to the question, what does the nihilist believe, Nietzsche wrote in The Will to Power, quote, Nihilism is the belief that everything deserves to perish. End quote. Moreover, Nietzsche declared, quote, Thorough nihilism is the conviction that life is absurd in the light of the highest values already discovered. End quote, and quote, the deed of nihilism is suicide. End quote. We should not be surprised that today's radicals, with their relativism and nihilism, are demanding that, as individuals and as a nation, we follow a course of deliberate suicide. Since they themselves are governed by a will to death, it is for them the only logical course of action. Warner speaks of the necessity of understanding the, quote, most malignant perversion of human-mindedness. We proceed with the conception of human-mindedness in which hatred of all who live is a key under... Hatred of all who live is a key underlying feeling Individual power is a salient craving, and revenge upon all who live is a major factor. End quote. In other words, these zombies, these living dead, hate the living with all the passion of their malignant and corrupt souls. They dedicate their lives to the destruction of all life and want all things to perish. For a man governed by the will to death, says Warner, it is, quote, more important for him to defeat others than to succeed. End quote. Such a person is envious of success in others, hates them for it, but is both afraid of success and avoids it. He wills defeat and failure. He finds pleasure in unhappiness.
He finds pleasure in unhappiness and misery, in defeats, in exact. He finds pleasure in unhappiness and misery, in defeat and in anxiety. In fact, states Warner, quote, victory through defeats may indeed become the safest form of victory, end quote. Such a person consciously may be working for victory. I'm beginning to feel a bit nauseous here. Mm -hmm. But unconsciously, aim for and welcome defeat. As a result, because so many millions all over the world are involved in this will to death, we have therefore a national and international mental condition which is best described by Warner's title, The Urge to Mass Destruction. We have now what Warner calls The Efforts of Man to Organise Mass Self-Destruction, To Seek a Mass Grave for All, End quote. He recognises that hatred for the God of Scripture is basic to this will to death. The hatred of God, we can add, governs all men who are outside of Christ. Because their basic sin is the attempt to become God, to determine or know good and evil independently of God, men find God a major obstacle in their drive for independence. As a result, they will... They will As a result, they will the death of God and in their diseased minds imagine that he is abolished and dead. But since man is a creature of God, man cannot wish the death of God, the ground of man's own existence, without thereby willing his own death. All atheism is therefore involved in this will to death. The answers Warner gives to this problem of the urge to mass destruction are non-Christian and therefore fallacious, although his analysis is excellent and a major contribution. We have this urge to mass destruction on all sides of us. It governs men in their political life as we chart a suicidal course with reference to foreign affairs. We have it in our personal lives and many men, as they sit behind the driver's wheel, seem very openly suicidal. We have the will to death present in rebellious youth, who deliberately experiment with death in the form of lawlessness and drugs and call their blindness living. We have this will to death in education, whereby proven values are forsaken for courses bound to increase ignorance and folly. And we have it in family life, as loose and careless exercise of authority by parents dissolves the life of the family. The suicide rate, moreover, is increasing rapidly and far more rapidly than statistics indicate. In almost all communities, only the most obvious cases are listed as suicide. To avoid public disgrace or religious problems for the family, the usual reports conceals the fact of suicide. But today, suicide is the number two cause of death among college students and the number three cause of death among those aged 15 to 19 years. The reasons given by suicidal persons in their notes are of particular interest. They are uniformly trivial. Old and young routinely kill themselves for the most insignificant and trifling reasons. It is obvious from this that their recorded reasons are not their real reasons. Because they are sinners, they are guilt-ridden, and guilt-ridden people are driven by a will to death. As a result, almost any pretext will do to drive them to suicide, because they are already driven by their... Con driven there. Whoa, whoa. because they are already driven there continually from within. But those who do not openly and obviously commit suicide are no less driven by the will to death. They demand courses of action, personally and nationally, which can lead only to mass destruction, to mass suicide. 
they are dominated by a passion to involve others and the world itself in their headlong plunge to destruction. They demand death in every area as their true morality. They favour a course of political and military suicide. They are for moral, spiritual, economic and military disarmament as their quick way to death. The urge to mass destruction is also present in the demand for abortion. It is significant that the errors in history which have favoured abortion have also been the great ages for high suicide rates. The two go hand in hand. They both represent a hatred of life. Joshua Lederberg, professor of genetics at Stanford, has said in favouring abortion, We cannot insist on absolute rights to life of a piece of tissue just because it bears a resemblance to humanity. The next step, of course, will be to deny anybody's right to life. If science has the right to take prenatal life, it has the right to take postnatal life because it has become judge over life. Not only do suicide and abortion go hard, Not only do suicide and abortion go together, but the same people who demand the right of abortion, the right to kill prenatal life, claim also to be against capital punishment. This is not surprising since they advocate murder by abortion. Why punish postnatal murders by capital punishment? Their claim is that they favour life, but... In reality, they demand freedom for the will to death. Jesus Christ, speaking as wisdom, declared that He that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death. Proverbs 8.36 This love of death and will to death is the consequence of man's apostasy from God. As God said to Israel, O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is thine help. Hosea 13.9 Man brings judgment and death on himself by his apostasy. Sinners, according to Susan. According to St. Paul, are, quote, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Romans 1, 30-32 The only antidote to this will to death is Jesus Christ, who declared, I am the resurrection and the life, John 11.25, in whom alone we have newness of life and the will to live. In him, our being from its innermost wellsprings is governed by life and the righteousness and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The will to death is then broken and the will to live to live what is that <clears throat> and the will to live given direction as always if you want to support this uh, effort the narration of all Rosh Duny's Amazon published works hopefully more as well but maybe I don't know Uh, You can do so by liking, sharing, and if you want to make a financial contribution, you can do so by going to nathanteacher.com, little old nathanteacher.com, clicking on that big old button that does say, so madly, so sweetly, so finally, donate, 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 donatist, forward.
These essays were delivered as a series of radio addresses in 1966 and 1967 over several stations from coast to coast. It would be wrong to say that they had a great popular reception, but in all areas save one, the response was surprisingly good. These essays were written not for broadcast but for publication as a summary statement of certain concepts of law and liberty. Their radio broadcasting was in large part made possible by the underwriting of Mr. Paul H. Axtede of Arcadia, California, and their publication by the underwriting of Mr. Frederick Reland of Pars- Parsippany. Parsippany! I tell you all about Parsippany! Parsippany! and their publication by the underwriting of Mr. Frederick Freeland of Parsippany, New Jersey, Mrs. Arlene Golnick of Orland, California, typed the manuscript... No, I'm not good enough. Why so difficult? and their publication by the underwriting of Mr. Frederick Freeland of Persephone, New Jersey. Mrs. Arlene Golnick of Orland, California, typed the manuscript. Mrs. Grace Flanagan mimeographed copies of all these radio addresses for circulation. Mrs. Florette Edwards corrected the proofs, together with my wife, Dorothy Rush Dooney. I am very grateful to them for their help and for their concern for our common cause. Rusus John Rushdoony. How'd you like me now? All right, well, that was the foreword. The foreword at the backward. What a book, eh? What a book. I hope that you've been blessed by it. And there's nothing left for me to say. Except... So, hope to see you soon. Cheerio.